My full name is Edward Burr II. I was a, a colonel of the United States Army, retired. I actually was in 10 major campaigns in World War II, five in World War II and five in Korea, in combat. Well, I grew up in the Army. My dad was an Army officer. I was, uh, from the age I was beginning to be aware of that and so forth. I wanted to go to West Point. I became very, I read stories about it. I followed its football team. And uh, uh, whereas my dad deserted my mom uh, in 37, she arranged for me to go to prep school. And with prep school behind me, I managed to win the District of Columbia appointment. So I went up there and of course, uh, planning on four years but we only had three years. And to tell you the truth, I was absolutely, really mostly miserable the time I was there. I really did not get out of the experience what I had hoped for. I went too young. And of course, the realities of what you go through up there are vastly different than the books written about it. I graduated from West Point in 1943 in June, and I was 21 years old at that time. I was, uh, 22 when I went into combat in, in Europe, and I was 29 when I went into combat in Korea. World War II was a war that, of course, you all have no idea of what it was really like, but it was, a, in a sense, it was a good war. And wars are not good, they're terrible things, and we lost an awful lot of people. But from the point of view of the nation, the nation was united. No matter where you went or what you did, uh, you were met with friendly people, people who were concerned about your being in the military. It was a, an all-out effort. The people back here in the States worked just as hard in that war supporting it as did the soldiers who were in the field. So it was a uh, unique, uh, unusual experience, which was totally different from my experience in Korea. I went over to Europe in World War II with a unit, and so I had all the protection of the unit as I traveled uh, into it and was part of it. But in Korea, I went over as a replacement, and, uh, and that experience as a replacement with, on board the ship I went over on, 850 other replacements, was, was had its own unique aspects to it. Well, my combat in Europe was, Close combat was really limited to this uh, uh, time in Normandy when I was a forward observer with the infantry. And, uh, and it, uh, it, it was the hedgerow country. It was, was very uh, tough going, more like World War I in many respects. And my division, for example, lost 1,600 people the first day it was in combat. And by the end of the third week, they had lost 5,000. And these were all infantrymen. So the Germans, the terrain was tough, the Germans were tough, and it was a, a rough way to, to get a beginning on the whole thing. When I came back from being wounded, I was uh, in a fire direction center in my artillery battalion and then a survey officer, and my work was done behind the lines, although our unit was always not much more than two or three, 4,000 yards behind the uh, front lines. I landed in Normandy on D plus 13. And I've always said that if you landed on Normandy, basically by after two in the afternoon, you really didn't land in Normandy. I mean, those people who landed in Normandy were the ones that were in the first or second wave. And in the case of Normandy, they were all killed. Uh, but it wasn't, once the beaches were cleared, then you could land with impunity. In effect, you might get a range of artillery in, but it wasn't the, like facing the machine guns and the 88s directly. My LST landed in the, in the midst of the biggest channel storm in 60 years. So that uh, uh, we landed in tremendous surf. We landed at the time that there, these wonderful docks that they had built, floating docks, were all being destroyed. And, uh, and we landed in the water. And, uh, whereas the units before us were waterproof, they decided they wanted to get us there so quickly, they did not waterproof us, and we're the ones that should have been waterproofed. So uh, it was a difficult job of getting our, our 
equipment off these uh, these ships. In fact, our my the four guns of the battery that I was associated with were on a sunken uh, one of the landing craft, and they had to bring the engineers had to bring derricks out and lift these guns out of the ship and put them on the beach. So and. Uh, that's the kind of, of situation we, we faced at the time of coming in. I don't think we were thinking very much about it. I, we, had, we knew we had a job to do. We had, they landed, we had to get those vehicles off the boat and on, on shore, and that's what we were concentrated on. And I, for myself, ended up out, outside the boat, standing by the, the open door ramp, up and getting the trucks to move down. Of course, as they moved down, all of them drowned. And the, the ship had, the storm had shifted the ship laterally, so that as we started to go off of the ship, the waves were now coming across us and, and sweeping over the vehicles. It was no longer the waves coming in behind us. So it was a very difficult process. And we got a lot of help from the engineers, bulldozers, to get these, get these vehicles ashore. I was with a, assigned to a company uh, uh, as the observer, and I, uh, we spent the night, it was like a World War I setup, that we were in a farmhouse with candlelight and lots of suspense and tension in the uh, room, and the, uh, I was with the captain when we jumped off, and the, uh, the barrage uh, didn't do the job. We put on a half-hour barrage, but they were well dug in. And the minute the barrage was lifted, uh, they, they came out of their holes, and we faced uh, a huge amount of fire coming in. And he wanted me to notify the artillery to go back and start the barrage again, and would have been very successful, because now we had them out in the open. But uh, I couldn't get my radio to work. You know, God, for a cell phone or iPhone or something like that that would have made communications work, but this uh, uh, frequency modulated radio I had wouldn't make contact. So I, I uh, moved up on the, uh, the side of the sunken road to try and get the contact. That's when I was hit. I did something really dumb. That's what it boils down to. What, um, what was uh, your experience during the, the Battle of the Bulge? Well, it's cold and, uh, and snowy. And again, I, I was operating as a survey officer uh, behind the actual uh, front lines. We were getting some shelling. Uh, but uh, the main thing about it was it was, uh, it was terribly cold. <laughs> and y'all were outfitted correctly. Uh, in a way, no. I, again, uh, I being in the artillery and moving by vehicle, uh, back and forth to a certain extent. What surveying we did, we did in the snow. But we didn't have the inconvenience of poor boots, for example. We had it, but nothing like the poor infantry who, uh, of course, were in it day and, and night and who developed trench foot and other terrible leg and foot problems. In Korea, I was uh, in charge of a fire direction center for a light outfit and a light outfit was a 105 battalion in support, direct support of an infantry and regiment. And, uh, and so we were usually about 1,000, 2,000 yards behind the line. So I had 18 guns, and the uh, infantry depended upon those guns. They were 105 howitzers, about a three-inch shell, but a, an airborne burst, so it was miserable for uh, infantry that got under it. And it was a touchy business because we had to be careful we didn't shoot at our own people because we're shooting guns where we don't know where we're shooting them. We can't see the target. So we're, we have to be uh, careful on how we direct those guns both in azimuth and in altitude, I mean range. So we uh, landed in Yokohama, went to Tokyo, did a little bit of, of check, uh, refreshing on weapon firing and then were shipped down to Sasebo, boated across to uh, Pusan, and then took the train, Pusan perimeter having now been eliminated, and we took the train. All well, the train ride in those days was probably about a four or five hour normal ride from Pusan to Seoul. It took us three days. 
And so we had, uh, I mean, we lived as bums, really. I was, had several friends I was with on that trip, and, and I'd been ribbed incessantly on my travel across the, the uh, seas in that I had bought a KPOC sleeping bag from L.L. Bean before I left. And of course, the Army issues sleeping bags. So everybody was amused that here's this Army guy carrying a sleeping bag with him. Well, only one slept comfortably for those three days on that train was Ned Burr in that sleeping bag. <laughs> but I joined uh, them and I was in Divardi headquarters for a while and then uh, I, I was promoted to major and I was moved down to the 64th field, which was a light 105 organization. I think I already mentioned them in brief. Uh, and and uh, in direct support of the infantry regiment uh, on the line. So we did a lot of firing. At, at one point, we were moved into the punch bowl, and the infantry, of course, were situated up on the ridge of the punch bowl. We were down in the valley behind them. And a, a 105 howitzer cannot fire close to infantry under those circumstances because once the shell clears the ledge, the ridge, it keeps going. Uh, so what we had to fire, and uh, I, uh, I did with, uh, with uh, a lot of, of skill, actually, was we fired high angle fire. We, f we raised the tubes to the point where the shell stops going out and starts coming back. And the shell would go up to a height of about 16,000 feet and then come down, more like a border. And that way I could put fire about five or 600 yards in front of the infantry. But the winds aloft are about 50 miles an hour there, and that will blow a shell. So when the FOs called in at two in the morning with the, the Chinese coming up the hill, which they always did every night, uh, we would have to give him 18 rounds at one time on one of his defensive fires. And you, you sat there and uh, just holding your breath till you heard from him that it was out. He didn't know where it was, but it was out in front of him, which was the important thing. Because the last thing in the world you want to do is drop 18 rounds in on your own people. So it was uh, a, a very tension. I think I lost about 25 pounds. I'd been home about a month, went to the bathroom one morning and passed out, fell in the bathtub from, from exhaustion. <laughs> So it was a busy time. I, I think it's a tremendous military force. And I think the Army has done a beautiful job with the, uh, with the uh, volunteer Army in organizing it and getting done. I regret in, in a way that we still don't have the draft system because the, the young men of the country, uh, we turned back to this country 11 million young men who were mature, had, had been thrown into mature activities, were grown up, responsible, uh, able to enter back into the American way of life as in the, the positive way they did that, that produced America really as it is today by what they did.